Hello everyone, good afternoon here from Chile. And hello everyone around the world. My name is Felipe Ochoa and I am a faculty of civil engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Chile. And today we have an excellent talk from Professor Adrian Russell from the University of New South Wales, uh, particularly a place where I, recent, I recently visited while, while I was attending the International Conference of Soil Mechanics in which I had the opportunity to meet Professor Russell, to interact with him, to talk to many of his students and know his amazing facilities, experimental and laboratory facilities at the University of New South Wales. Uh, hello, Professor Russell. Adrian, hello. how are you back <laughs> there in, the, in Australia? What time is yeah. in Australia? It's now eight o'clock in the morning. It's winter time as well, but yeah. It's, no, uh, no, yeah. What, what about the temperature over there? It's around 12 degrees right now. So 12 degrees. This is, this is as low as it gets in Sydney. This Quite is... a merciful winter. Yeah, that's, it's not too bad. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Professor Russell, we, we usually have some, some questions with our guests uh, right before starting the lecture. And uh, in this context, I, I have some questions for you. The first sure. question would be, how is it that Professor Russell became Professor Russell? Uh, what your story since the early years when you were a student, how did you get interested in geotech? Uh, because I my understanding is that before University of New South Wales, you were in uh, you were in London, right? In, in England. In England, yeah. So <clears throat> that's a good question. I mean, I was a good at mathematics when I was a student at high school. And I, 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 it was quite clear I would be an engineer, but I was not sure if I would be a mining engineer or a civil engineer. And ended, I ended up choosing civil. I, I, and I thought I would go and build skyscrapers and bridges and buildings and become a structural engineer. But of course, when you do civil, you find out there's so many other more exciting things than just concrete and steel. And, and beams. <laughs> and, and, that's right. And I became a geotechnical engineer. And um, look, uh, and then I went and worked in industry. That was always the goal. And I enjoyed that, but I was looking for something a little bit more challenging uh, mentally and theoretically, I guess you could say. And I ended up doing a PhD and, and became an academic. It was never an ambition or, you know, it was just something that happens with no planning. And, um, and when I was in my PhD in the last one year, my supervisor said, right, it's time for you to go and find an academic job. And, and, and I didn't know. I, I thought I'd, be go, I'd go back into industry and be a consultant. But um, I applied for a job in England at the University of Bristol. And for some reason, they gave it to me. And that started my academic career. And How many uh, years did you spend in, in Bristol? Four years. Four years. So that was straight. straight. In fact, I went there before I finished my PhD, so. Oh, I see. You yeah, finished from, was, from afar. Yeah, that, that was very difficult. Um, mm. The last one year of my PhD, I was also a lecturer. So that was very stressful and trying to finish my PhD as well as do a good job in my new lecturing position. And, but yeah, look, that's history now. So uh, yeah. How, how, many, academic. <laughs> how many, how many, how many, how big was, was the group in, in Bristol? That, that's a so big university, a very big university in England. It, it's, it's typical university size in England. It's around 20,000 students and, okay. and the geotechnical group had 
one, two, three, five academics. So it's not too big. In fact, it's the same as what we have now at UNSW. So it's a good size, you know. What we were talking about? So yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, four years at the University of Bristol and then back to UNSW. I see. I see. And how many years have you been in NSW? So you have been in, in UNSW maybe 15 years, 14 years? Yeah, so as a academic for uh, 15 years, but I was also a student there for maybe eight or nine years. So <laughs> I've been there a long time. So I see you are you are a, you are a, you are a, you are an associate professor now or full prof full professor you are full professor full professor now. yeah full professor two years ago yeah I see very very nice and and how many students do you have so it's a big university uh, it's around sixty thousand students and uh, this is typical of Australian universities. Um, they're very big. We have roughly two thirds undergraduate, one third postgraduate, and roughly one quarter of those are international. Um, it's a comprehensive university, so we teach everything. And um, civil engineering is one of the bigger departments, and we have maybe two and a half thousand or three thousand students in civil engineering. So yeah, our classes have 500 students in civil engineering. So very big. I see. Um, and, and in your group, in your group, you how many students? In our group, I have five PhD students. Uh, the group has around 20 PhD students. And um, so that's spread across five uh, academic staff. So. Look, this is a good size, you know. Um, this see. is sort of typical, yeah. It's a good size. I see, I see. And uh, and what 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 is what are your projects these days? What are your current projects? I I, well, I guess tailing since is in the in the in the center these days, right? It is. So, just one year ago, my employment situation changed. A little bit. I, I uh, received a, a four-year fellowship, so that means it's called a future fellowship, and it's funded by the Australian Research Council, the ARC, and that means I do research 100% of the time, and my topic is um, uh, related to tailings liquefaction. So I have to obviously do research, but also um, to try and build collaborations with other universities around the world and industry, and also uh, look at knowledge transfer and training um, activities with industry and, and other universities as well. That, so it, it's, yeah. That, that fellowship means that for four years, uh, you are able to not to teach, for instance, if necessary. But zero teaching. Before okay. Years. So the only, the only teaching I do is it's not standard university teaching. It's it's outside of that. It's it's okay. within the fellowship. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You're gonna miss it. I'm I'm assuming you're gonna miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I, it's a, it's <laughs> not a different yet, type of teaching. Not yet, but you will miss it at <laughs> <Okay>. some point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, and is there any any just just to to move forward with your presentation? Is there any 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 activity that you like to practice among so much geotech and what what do you like to do for your hobbies or anything that oh, not yes, everybody yeah. knows about Professor Russell? Look, I've got two children. One is two boys, one is nine, one is 12. And they both play rugby. So I, I'm a football coach for rugby. So I, I, that's what I do in my spare time. I so I, I did you play rugby? Yeah, yeah. When you were younger? Yeah, when I was younger. So it's, I see. Uh, I see. Not you are not playing anymore rugby. No, no. 
I see. I just, I, I'm on the sidelines now. Actually. I see. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. So you go every week and play rugby with your kids. That's right. <laughs> oh, nice. That's cool. That's cool. That's very cool. Okay, Professor Russell, I, I will let you... I will let you share with us your, your knowledge. Thank you very much again for being here with us. And uh, I, will, I will turn down my camera and microphone. Okay, thank you very much again, Adrian, for being here with us. Thank you. That's a pleasure. And so you can share my screen. Uh, so yeah, can I can, see, I can see it. Yeah. yeah, I can see it. Okay. So... Look, the, the topic of today's talk uh, is partial saturation influences on characterization and strength of silty tailings. So this is um, a part of my, my fellowship research uh, funded by the Australian Research Council. So I will talk a lot about some background knowledge and what we already know from soils in the civil sector, but then I'll focus a lot on two particular tailings types as well. A lot of the content has been produced in partnership with um, the three other universities here in Australia, as well as six mining companies. This is through a large uh, joint research project that is just finished now, but um, a lot of the knowledge we've gained uh, has come from that as well. So it, this is just a formal acknowledgement to all those other collaborators and, and partners. So let's see our slide. Here we go. Just a quick note, UNSW is located in Sydney. Like I said, it has around 60,000 students. It's a very large engineering faculty. It's, it's primarily a, a technical engineering university. Pardon me, and, and it ranks quite well. We're generally, our research in civil ranks the first in Australia and, and is quite highly ranked internationally as well. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, like I said, we have five tenured academics in geotech, around four contract academics or research associates, around 20 PhD students. Um, so this is a good sized group. It, it's, it's typical and, and of sort of a civil engineering department at other universities. Look, this is just a few comments about my path towards uh, civil engineering. So I was raised on a dairy farm in the Hunter Valley, which is 250 kilometers north, east, uh, west of Sydney. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of cows and that's what I used to do as a child was milk the cows, but I was surrounded by coal mines. And so my family farm is, is here. And these are coal mines. You know, the, the, and the distance is here, that's roughly two kilometers to give you an idea of how far away they are, which is you know, obviously very close. And the, these orange circles I've drawn are actually tailings dams. So um, you can see that tailings dams surrounded my childhood and you could see those from my farm, you know, and I was never worried about their safety or anything, but they were obviously ever present in, 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 uh, in my childhood. Um, so I went to UNSW as a student, I did civil engineering and then a PhD, but in between uh, the bachelor's and PhD, I spent some years in industry and also had a small um, uh, stay at the University of Bristol in the UK. So, uh, yeah, look, I guess um, you, you're influenced by your childhood to an extent. So I was surrounded by soil, you know, being on a farm, you, you're always getting dirty and digging holes. But surrounded by mines as well. Droughts and floods were a big part of my childhood, worrying about those things, the natural hazards. But there's a lot of hands-on manual work and problem solving, and that certainly um, helps become a, a geotechnical engineer. Um, <clears throat> here's just some example of some of the equipment we have in our civil engineering department that, that is used in this research. Uh, this is a, a calibration chamber for cone penetration testing. This silver 
cell contains a very large sample of soil or tailings. And we can control suction and we can control the stress states put on it. And then we can push through the top uh, just a, a cone and change the velocity to explore different drainage rates and, and, and do all sorts of different things. Um, this next device on the right is an earthquake shaking table. Uh, this is the table top where we attach a model of a, a tailing structure or something else, and we can shake it horizontally and vertically. Uh, and we use this scissor mechanism uh, to impose the vertical motion. Uh, the, these two things here are the actuators, but, but they both push horizontally. One controls the horizontal movement, but the other one using this scissor mechanism controls the vertical movement. Um, we have other devices, x-rays and a whole lot of triaxial and, and the elevated temperature and pressure and so on. But I, I guess um, these two machines I designed and built myself uh, using obviously skills I built up as a, a child on a farm where you have to use tools and machines all the time. And you know, it's a strange thing that now, even in my university work, I still build machines by myself. So then uh, use them in my research now. So yeah, that's just a little uh, side thing. Okay, so now onto the topic. Uh, I'll get a little bit of background and motivation on, on why we're doing research in this area. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we know from the civil sector so far, the cone penetration testing in unsaturated soils. I'll talk about the importance of the drainage conditions. In a saturated setting, we, we usually just think about fully drained or undrained or sometimes partially drained. But I'll talk about what partial saturation does to those drainage conditions and the importance of it. And then I'll get on to the results in unsaturated tailings and <clears throat> CBT results as well as strengths and, and how to interpret those. And, and then I'll just give some you know, final messages for relevant to people in the industry, especially. Okay. <clears throat> so what are unsaturated soils and tailings? Well, they're mixtures of solid particles with air and water in the pore space. So the water usually accumulates first at the grain contacts. Um, the water phase has a pressure UW, the air phase has a pressure UA. And there is a, a curved interface between that water and air due to the capillary action or the surface tension of that water. And that surface tension of the water pulls the particles towards each other and increases the contact forces and therefore the effective stress and the strength. And we call that pulling action a suction. And, it, and it's defined as the difference between the air pressure and the water pressure. So we can deal with unsaturated soils or tailings in many problems, slopes, dams, compacted soils, but also tailings and even mining or you know, during transportation and handling, and that becomes an issue as well. <clears throat> Suction increases the effective stress, and we use this equation to define the effective stress. The suction we multiply by chi, which has a value between zero and one, we call it the effective stress parameter. It's a type of geometrical correction because the suction stress doesn't act uniformly across a cross section. Uh, so we have to apply this correction factor and we add it on to a total stress to get our effective stress. And once you've quantified the effective stress, you can then go and apply all the usual things that we do for saturated materials, for example, the shear strength we can define using a more Coulomb type equation um, in the usual way. So drying causes a suction and strength to increase, wetting causes them to reduce. Now there are 
<coughs> alternate notations and terminologies that are sometimes used, especially in North America and Canada, uh, you'll see uh, people quantify this phi B term, which is a friction angle uh, that relates to the suction part. But it you get exactly the same sort of mechanical effect when you relate it to chi using this expression. So here's some typical behavior of a, an unsaturated uh, soil. This happens to be a, a decomposed granite, a, a well-graded silty sand. So very similar to a tailings. Uh, I'll start with some saturated test results. These are two test results down here. The void ratio is around 0 0.4, which is quite loose for this particular material. And you see that Q, the shear stress, increases as we distort or shear the sample. Exactly the type of response you would expect for a drains loose material. And you get volume, volumetric compression as you do that. I've got two other simulations shown here when the let me just clear my throat, sorry. Pardon me. Two other simulations for an unsaturated sample. Now these happen to have even larger void ratios. So they're even looser than those saturated ones, but they have a constant suction in this case of around 100 or 200 kilopascals. And look at the response, you get a, 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 a pronounced peak followed by some softening. Very typical of what you would expect for a, a dense material if it was drained. Even there, they're looser than the saturated counterparts. You get a little bit of volumetric compression followed by dilation. So suction is making the soil feel as though it's denser or more over consolidated. And that happens because of a phenomenon known as suction hardening. I'll explain how it happens here by referring to compression lines. A saturated material will show some kind of virgin compression like this. We get a, <clears throat> a fairly stiff initial response we hit a pre-consolidation pressure, and then you move along a normal consolidation line. When it's unsaturated, that normal consolidation line shifts towards the right. So we still get that initial stiff response, but the pre-consolidation pressure is moved towards the right, and now you're moving down a new normal consolidation line. So if this is the initial state of the soil here, if we're saturated, that would be your pre-consolidation pressure. But if it's unsaturated, this would be pre-consolidation pressure over here. So you can see that suction is increasing the pre-consolidation pressure, increasing the over-consolidation ratio, making the soil feel stiffer, and stronger or, or denser. And that's why we're seeing this response in, in the triaxial of tests. So we call this suction hardening. Now there's a, an associated shift of the critical state lines as well. If these are our normal consolidation lines, that first one on the outside there is for unsaturated. This one's for saturated. These are the critical state lines. This is the unsaturated one and this is a saturated one. So they shift by the same amount as the normal consolidation lines. They stay separated from the normal consolidation lines by the same amount. And this is important when we calculate things like state parameter, which is so important in uh, characterization of tailings. And we'll come back to that a bit later. That's the basics of soil behavior. But the way we quantify chi is also important. And we have to refer to water retention or what we call soil water characteristic curve or the water retention curve. And it's basically a relationship between 
degree of saturation and suction. And it just so happens <clears throat> when you take the double log uh, plots of those two quantities, that the relationships are linear in this plane. So this is an initially saturated sample. If we increase suction gradually, it stays saturated, hits a certain suction value, and then it begins to desaturate. And you move along what's called the main drying curve. If we wetted the sample from a dry state, you would move up along the main wetting curve. And you can zigzag between those or move between those on one of these scanning curves. And there's an infinite number of those scanning curves. So you're located, your, your location depends on whether you're drying or wetting or transitioning between drying or wetting. So the double log plot and linearity means that we have a power law that connects degree of saturation to suction. <coughs> Pardon me. The air entry, or sorry, the, the denominator on the suction axis is either the air expulsion suction, which is this value here, or, or the air, air, air entry suction. So as you wet, so dry out the soil, you need a certain suction magnitude before the air is able to enter the soil. It has to overcome the surface tension of that air water interface to break into the soil. So that's why desaturation only commences once you reach a certain suction magnitude. Now there's a, <clears throat> a companion set of curves that relate chi to our suction. There are also straight lines and uh, given by this function here. So alpha is the slope of the main drying and wetting curves. Omega is the slope of the, the chi relationship. And these are some typical numbers. We know omega is always around about minus 0 0.55 for all soils and tailings. <clears throat> alpha varies from about 0.25 to 0.85. Beta, which is the slope of the scanning curves, is just some function of alpha. And this, this other Greek symbol here, which is the slope of our scanning curves in our chi relationship, depends on the other terms through this relationship. Now, there's a void ratio dependence to this as well. <clears throat> Obviously, the denser the material, the smaller the void ratio, the smaller the pore size distribution ends the larger the suction needs to be for the air to break into the soil or the tailings. So these break points, these air entry and air expulsion suctions depend on void ratio according to these laws. And, and these, these power laws are actually derived from theory uh, using fractals. Uh, I, I won't go into the mathematics of a fractal, but it works for um, well-graded materials like tables very well. And the exponent on the void ratio happens to be what we call the fractal dimension of the particle size distribution. And I'll explain what that means in a moment, but <coughs> it has a number usually between two and three. And it's quite easy to determine from the soil water, uh, from the particle size distribution curve. Look, straight lines in these double log plots lets us do some simple mathematical connections between different quantities. For example, here chi s <clears throat> is related to the gravimetric water content and void ratio. And these power law exponents are just slopes of the curves and so on from these, these core relationships. So details are in these papers, but, but look, it's, this is the basic linearity in a double log plot that I'll be using for all the tailings as we move forward here. <clears throat> so,
I'll talk now about strength and stability and how we can put that chi this term into <coughs> some calculations. So I start by defining cohesion as a function of depth. It increases linearly or decreases linearly with depth. It's, it's C subscript zero at the ground surface, increases with depth Z according to <coughs> some rate of change, which is a capital K. Likewise, the chi S, it increases or decreases with depth linearly. So chi S subscript zero is the value at the ground surface. We can put the suction part <clears throat> and, the, and the variation of cohesion into an equivalent cohesion and an equivalent unit weight using these expressions. And once you do that, you can analyze a problem using a total stress analysis. You don't need any other consideration of the suction in, in the analysis. We proved this using some theory called slip line theory, looking at a whole range of strength and stability problems. For example, shallow footings and a bearing capacity type uh, failure, uh, slope stabilities, uh, or retaining walls, and, and the same, same equivalent cohesion unit weights are all that we need to use to capture the suction effects. Each of these problems has a set of dimensionless groups which govern strength and stability. For example, um, for the slope stability problem, the dimensionless groups happen to be these quantities and they come out of the slip line theory. Uh, <clears throat> so if we have a set of real input parameters, a unit weight of 18.5 cohesion, chi s that varies linearly with depth, the surcharge q. They happen to <clears throat> give these values of the dimensionless groups and they produce a factor of safety of one. Now, using this equivalent method, we can calculate an alternate unit weight and, and, and alternate cohesion we put those into those dimensionless groups, set chi s to be zero now, but we quantify exactly the same values of f, t, and phi. And they will give us it's still a factor of safety of one. And just to prove that the theory works, I get my students to put in outrageous combinations of unit weight, cohesion, chi s, and so on. They give exactly the same quantities here inside our dimensionless groups. And again, you compute a factor of safety of one. And that's demonstrated here. Just using a commercial software, this was a <clears throat> slide from the rock science uh, people. But you can see, you know, different com combinations of soil properties both give a factor of safety of one because the dimensionless groups are the same for both problems. So this gives some theoretical validity to the idea that you only have to get the quantities of the dimensionless groups right, which govern the physics of the problem. It doesn't matter what the individual soil properties are that make up those groups. So we can use this idea to essentially capture suction effects <coughs> in these equivalent cohesion and unit weight terms and then just resort to a total stress analysis. So this will be really useful to a practitioner. They can model strength stability using commercial softwares and total stress analyses without <clears throat> resorting to those inbuilt unsaturated soil features of the software. You don't need them. They get confusing. The terminology gets a little bit strange. This equivalent method, I think, is much simpler a lot of the time. Now, I must go back to the previous slide and point out that this logic really only works when the chi s part doesn't change a lot during the deformation leading up to failure. So we need essentially a drained type of loading. So uh, this we know is true when the degree of saturation is less than about 0.5.
I'll explain why that happens when we talk about the CBT results, but that's an important point to make. Let me just um, I'll clear my throat here, sorry. Okay, now back onto the main topic. Why address the CBT and unsaturated soils tones? Well, we, we, we know that large sections of a storage facility are unsaturated. That could be above a phreatic surface, but it also can be below a phreatic surface where embankment lifts have been constructed on previously desiccated surfaces. And, you know, we push cones into these materials periodically every two years or so to assess our strengths and, and do our risk assessments. But very little is known about how to interpret cone data in these unsaturated sections, so hence this research. Uh, it is possible that you can use cone data to get an estimation of suction, but more importantly, we want estimations of initial state and void ratio, because that, and even if the tailings become saturated in the future, as the phreatic surface rises, that initial void ratio or that void ratio is not going to change a lot. So we need to have some knowledge of it even when we're pushing our cone in when unsaturated. Look, this will remove a lot of conservatism, unnecessary conservatism when we, when we do stability checks and design buttresses or whatever. So we want every little bit of strength to be properly accounted for inside those assessments to avoid you know, unnecessary, unnecessarily expensive uh, remedial works. It also adds reliability and confidence to what we do. Often you have a range of factors of safety that you have to work within and, and you err towards the lower number if you have more confidence in your data and that account for suction will let you do that. An interesting thing happens immediately above the free attic surface due to the very small pore space in tailings, we get this phenomenon called capillary rise where water is sucked up into the pores and suspended in the tailings. It's held there in tension in a static way, but the tailings is essentially unsaturated. So that, sorry, so is essentially saturated. So we've got a saturated system with negative water pressures due to capillary rise. Same thing happens in capillary tubes. Uh, so just that red fluid is just colored water. And you can see we've got a very large diameter tube here. But with a small diameter tube, you can see that the water is drawn up into the capillaries and held in tension due to this phenomenon. Now the height of that capillary rise section depends on that suction, either the air entry or the air expulsion value divided by the unit weight of water. And it can be up to around 10 meters high in some tailings. They have that optimal pore size distribution that lets it be um, that much. In natural soils, it might only be a few centimeters or, or um, in some clays, it can be much, much more, but in tailings, it can be sort of between one and 10 meters quite easily. So you have hydrostatic conditions <clears throat> from your phreatic surface and below, but you also have hydrostatic conditions above your phreatic surface where the water is in tension or has a negative pressure. And the same when you break above that capillary rise section, does air exist in the tailings and you have this curved Caius profile that deviates from that linear hydrostatic value. Okay, so let's get on to some CBT observations in um, natural soils. This is a, a clean beach sand, not beach, it's, it's, it's from Ottawa in Canada, but just a clean sand, <coughs> much like you find on beaches. They did cone testing in very small calibration chambers um, 
And you can see it at, at very low degrees of saturation, your current resistance was roughly double that of the saturated value. This is another sand. This is in Perth here in Australia. A site at the end of the wet and dry seasons. At the end of the wet season, this is your current data. End of the dry season, it's out here. You can see that the current resistance is more than doubled due to this partial saturation. This is a Sydney sands that um, we tested at UNSW. You can see at low confining stresses, <clears throat> suction is again roughly doubling your cone resistance. Suction also causes a cone resistance increase at larger confining stresses, but you can see now because your effective stress is given by this expression, the suction part has a smaller overall influence on the effective stress as your total stress increases. So you can see, you know, the, while there's still an influence, it just becomes lesser at larger confining stresses. This is another soil, a decomposed granite. Again, cone resistance increases due to suction. So let's talk about drainage conditions. <clears throat> Certainly from a practical point of view, it would be easiest to be able to assume suction is constant or that chi S is constant uh, during the cone test. That means we can analyze them as we would a drained uh, situation, saturated conditions where you have a constant water pressure. So we'd be able to do something similar for the unsaturated. But, but the reality is, it's the moisture content that's constant. We push the current in very quickly. There's insufficient time for water to enter or exit the, the system. Instead, the, the moisture content is constant and we have some strange drainage scenario going on. There's a lot of air in the pore space. Air is much more compressible than water. So you get some deformation of the tailings uh, and therefore some suction change while your moisture content is constant. But we were able to do some cavity expansion analysis and explore these different drainage influences. An expanding cavity, the wall pressure required to cause the expansion is roughly similar to the QC that we measure in the CPT. So we can take some guidance from that theoretical cavity expansion work to understand what is also happening around the cone. And we found that the constant chi s condition is a very close approximation to the other possible drainage conditions. And, and you can assume chi s is constant from a practical point of view without any significant errors or inaccuracies in, in the data. The error is usually less than sort of 20 percent and often less than five percent. So that constant chi s is a really powerful assumption. And it means <clears throat> well, it's, it's only true when the volume of air in our pore space is very small compared to the overall volume, less than about 15%. Or in other words, when our degree of saturation is less than, say, 0 0.7 or something like that. So you need enough air in the pore space so that as, you, as your tailings deforms, the skeleton is able to deform quite freely, much like it does for a drained condition when saturated. And I'll come back to that message. That's a very key requirement that um, we make and, and, and need to, uh, to interpret our CBT data. So here's some <clears throat> synthesis of trends for the Sydney Sands data. We can plot cone resistance against mean effective stress. And we get, um, you know, nice power laws that connect QC to mean effective stress. This is the Baldy type approach, mainly used in the civil sector. <clears throat> we can also use a state parameter approach of Mean and Jefferies. We can plot this kind of normalized cone resistance against 
state parameter and um, you have this exponential law with constants K and M, you know, which we know so well. The, <clears throat> both approaches work quite well. Here, saturated and unsaturated data is overlaid. So there's no difference between the two. <clears throat> the same trend exists. But we've put suction inside the effect of stress to calculate the state parameter and also the, the effect of stress here in the vertical axis. That's very important. The two relationships are interchangeable. Uh, the exponent here, 0 0.85, happens to be one minus lambda times M. So uh, although they look very different, the two types of interpretation frameworks are very similar. It's important to note here that this is a soil that doesn't have any suction hardening. So our <clears throat> normal consolidation lines for saturated and unsaturated states happen to be the same. There might be some suction hardening and a small difference between those two lines, but it's so small that we can ignore it and um, just treat them as one and the same. Okay. We can then do things like interrelate two current resistances and um, <clears throat> connect those to the ratio of the effective stresses raised to a power here 0 0.85. So if you've got knowledge of one cone resistance and another, they just simply scale with those effective stresses uh, when raised to a power. And likewise, we can have one cone resistance in a saturated state and one in an unsaturated state. And again, just scale them according to their effective stresses raised to a power. Going a little bit further with this, this sand, we can do things like um, show what happens when we account for suction correctly or ignore it. <clears throat> Here our total stress is 25, chi is 25. So our effective stress is 50. We can plug those in uh, to all the, <clears throat> the expressions and, and determine a void ratio, friction angle, and a saw behavior type index and a cyclic resistance ratio. But, if we ignore suction, assume our total and effective stresses are the same thing, so we're basically not measuring suction and assuming it's zero. You can see that you get <clears throat> erroneous estimations of void ratio, friction angle, soil behavior index, and so on. So, and unconservative estimations. We, we, we might think the soil is denser or stronger than what it truly is. So we need to be really careful there when we interpret our CBT data, we need to account for suction effects. <clears throat> Back to that perf sands, <clears throat> we can determine chi S with depth just by interrelating those effective stresses at different depths. Here's our chi S expression. Um, so very simple task. Now, with that other soil, the silty sand, I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but it's a soil that has suction hardening. So we get <clears throat> a suction dependence of our normal consolidation lines. It means that the responses for a saturated state are also very different to those for an unsaturated state. And that's because uh, of this suction dependence and, and we also have different drainage conditions. When, when, the, when we push a cone into this soil, when it's saturated, we have an undrained or a partially drained scenario. But when we push a cone in while it's unsaturated, we have essentially a drained condition. The chi S part is constant. So we're getting very different trends between our cone resistance and our soil state because we have different drainage um, paths present around the cone. So it means that we can't interrelate K 
cone resistances for saturated and unsaturated using that power law, because that would require drain conditions to be present in both. But we can do things like when two tests are unsaturated, interrelate the cone resistances as we did for the Sydney sand. So that, that's fine. Classification, important. Here we've put <clears throat> suction into the effective stress in the usual way. Plot of the data in these cl classification charts. I've also plotted data when suction effects have been ignored. That these are the cross symbols. So these, so here we I've used total stress rather than effective to plot that data erroneously on purpose. And you can see that it does cause a relocation and perhaps a misrepresentation of the soil type, but not too much for the Sydney sand. But when we look at another soil, this is a, a silty sand with up to sort of 8% fines. We do get a very pronounced error in our classification if we use a total stress rather than an effective stress here on the abdominal denominator. So these are the data correctly plotted, accounting for the effective stresses. We're below a water table here. This is a hydraulically deposited fill to build an airport. Immediately above the water table, or at, at, at low tide, <clears throat> when the water table is a bit lower, you can see that the um, same data, same soil, but when you ignore the suction effects in that partial saturation region, you get an erroneously large QTN value, causing you to think that your soil is much stronger or more dilating than what it truly is. And the same thing can happen inside of tailings if we don't put suction into our effective stress. Things like our cyclic resistance ratios will be incorrectly determined as well. So we need to be really careful and properly put suction into our effective stress. So let's now move on to tailings. So um, like I said, six mining companies have helped out here and three other universities. Here are the key people, but um, I'll just get off the results now. <clears throat> Look, the, the, the results I've been presenting are contained in this recent geotechnique paper we've just had accepted. Um, it, it's actually open access at the moment, so you can go onto the journal's website and download it for free. So I encourage you and your industry colleagues to do that. <clears throat> But the particle size distributions for two tailings shown here, one's a copper, one's a gold, it happened to be almost identical. So there's no real difference, but obviously from different continents and different rocks and so on. But <clears throat> what I encourage you to do when plotting particle sizes is take a log scale of your percentage passing. And you'll see that you see uh, linear responses, certainly for the first two or three log cycles, when you have a well graded material. And the slope of that line gives us our fractal dimension of the material. So the slope here is 0 0.39. <clears throat> so our, our fractal dimension is equal to three minus that slope which is three minus 0 0.39 or 2.61. So that's just a, a geometrical property of that tailings, which then goes into our relationship that, that scales our air entry or our air expulsion suction with the, the void ratio. That's how you determine it, very easy. Now we did a whole lot of triaxial tests in saturated and unsaturated states. This is not always available to a, a practice, practitioner, but I'll talk about what we can do about that later. But you'll see saturated triaxials through here with a, a, a 
keeping the state line drawn as well. Unsaturated triaxles up here. Constant value is a suction. And you can see that we get a suction dependent shift of the critical state line. We did, we plotted the peak friction angle in excess of the critical state value against the state parameter. The data more or less plots in a unique way and we you know, use that in practice to get a drained friction angle as well. I've put the effective stress and the shifted critical state line into that state parameter calculation. So that is an important point to note. Likewise for the other tailings, suction dependent critical state lines due to this suction arming phenomenon. Here's some water retention curves. This is the, the gold tailings, and then this is the copper, but I won't go into those. Um, or the, the key data show on, on the figures. Now here's um, our current penetration test results plotted in a normalized way. We, we recovered these using two calibration chambers, one large and one small in two different laboratories. Normalized current resistance on the vertical, state parameter on horizontal, saturated and unsaturated data plots here. We see the same trends for both defined by the same <clears throat> K and M values here. And that's because we have properly put suction into our state parameter quantity, but also because for both drained and undrained tests, so for, for both saturated and unsaturated tests, we have drained conditions prevailing. The saturated tests were performed very, very slowly. So we knew we had drained conditions around the cone. The, so the unsaturated tests were performed at a much higher penetration rate, but there's enough air in the pore space so that the penetration rate doesn't matter. And we always have a drained condition around the cone tip. Now, likewise, for the other tailings over here on the right, all the data more or less collapses onto a unique line. But only when we have a volume of air relative to the overall volume that is larger than about 0 0.15. In other words, we need enough air in the pore space so the tailings can perform, then we have a pseudo drained condition prevail all the time. When the air ratio is smaller, we've got a few results which show that the, the trend is no longer at bay. So we have this pseudo partially drained, partially saturated scenario. We don't yet know how to interpret the data for those conditions. It's only, only when we have enough air in the pore space can we assume that we have this drained condition prevailing all the time. Uh, incidentally, I've plotted the B and Jeffries correlations using their relationships with lambda 10 and so on. And, and they happen to give a fairly poor indication of uh, what the trend should be. But, uh, so just be really careful with those, those correlations of B and Jeffries that don't always work very well. So what are the conditions required for uniqueness? Well, we need, like I said, enough air in the pore space so that the volume is around about 15% of the total. This means that the deformation, the soil skeleton will be pseudo drained and that's what controls the um, QC the most. When that volume of air ratio is less than about 0.15, we have this complicated scenario that we don't yet know how to interpret. We're working on that now. And we only see uniqueness when we, our saturated tests were also performed slowly. So we have drain conditions. If we now look at some field data uh, taken from the, the storages where those samples were taken from, we've got two cone resistances 
shown here on the left, a CPT1, a CPT2, very similar except for a one meter section down here where CPT2 was performed very slowly. So we had drain conditions in that. So knowing we have drain conditions means we can apply those relationships between cone resistance and, and state parameter to determine our state parameter. And once we've got that state parameter, we can interrelate it to the current resistance measured for the undrained results and come up with an alternate expression that relates state parameter to our normalized code for undrained conditions. And that's what this line is through here. So we're able to make that alternate presentation for undrained conditions by comparing two sets of CPT results. And we've, once we've got that new correlation, we can then apply it to the whole depth of penetration and determine the state parameters of every other location. And that's what's shown here on, the, on these two figures on the right. Uh, here it happens to be void ratio, here it's state parameter. And you can see that the void ratio estimations are identical to those more or less recovered directly from piston sample measurements. This um, state parameter that I've drawn on the right with little subscript S is a state parameter that would apply in the future if the tailings were to become saturated by a rise in the phreatic surface. And I've just assumed the water is at the ground surface, but you can assume it to be anywhere you like, and you can see how the state parameters happen to be one. 0 0.05, which is, you know, very high and, and, and very contractive, indicating we might have some problems in this structure. This is another set of data interpretations for the copper tailings. I think this one is, yeah. Uh, now, before I get onto this, I, I, I should point out that <coughs> We can identify in the, in, the, in, the, in the gold tailings, the possible existence of a phreatic surface through here. You can see how the water seems to increase hydrostatically with depth. And we're getting good agreements with our poor pressure for a hydrostatic condition in that drain part of the CPT. But we can extend that upwards by some amount to try and explore the existence of the capillary rise section. You can see the water pressures go negative and, and then suddenly stop and we're getting sort of nonsense or, or, or poor measurements out of our cone. So I think in this case, we've probably got around one and a half meters of capillary rise. Okay, the cone tip is trying to measure negative water pressures in this region as it should. Obviously, they're influenced by the drainage rate. You know, they've probably got undrained conditions, so they're not hydrostatic in the, in the purest sense, but they're negative, and that's what the current's trying to measure. It's only when you're in the partial saturated region do you get nonsensical pore pressure readings. Okay, so this is back to the copper tailings. Uh, Mostly near zero pore pressure readings indicating the tailings is unsaturated. We get spikes locally where I think we've got saturated layers inside the tailings. So if we just focus on the unsaturated parts, so here, 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 and so on, we can use that relationship between cone resistance and state parameter to determine our void ratios. And again, they're agreeing very nicely with our direct measurements for block samples. And again, I've calculated a state parameter representing a future state when it, when it becomes saturated. So just another demonstration there. Now this requires knowledge of how our critical state lines relocate due to suction hardening. And that is not always available to you. So there is another 
presentation that we can use. And I've drawn it here where we relate code resistance to total stress. Total stress is here, void ratio here, moisture contents here. So there's no suction information here at all. But we're getting these sort of, for a given total stress, we're getting, you know, a clump of trends that relate our code resistance to void ratio for different moisture contents. So this is something you can construct yourself from your tailings dam and then use in practice. I've constructed these lines using the knowledge of the relationship with state parameter, but I've also assumed that the hydraulic states are located at the midpoints of scanning curves. And, and what does that mean? And why did I make that assumption? Let's talk about that now. Like I said before, you, you can have a, a main dry curve over here, a main wetting curve over here. And um, the hydraulic state shifts between one and the other by locating itself on a scanning curve. Just let me... Um, um, Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, so the, the hydraulic state in most practical situations locates somewhere between your drying curve and your wetting curve the whole time. And we think it stays on a scanning curve. It takes very extreme drying events like a flood, uh, sorry, like a, a severe drought for, for the state to dry out enough and move down a drying curve. And likewise, it takes extreme wetting events like a, a really bad flood for your hydraulic state to become wet enough and move up its uh, main wetting curve. We think most of the time it lays at the midpoint between a drying and wetting curve <clears> on <throat> this scanning curve. And this is some real field data from a soil slope that proves that to be true. And look, we're, we're not exactly sure that this um, will apply all the time, but, but it, it, it seems to be a reasonable assumption that works for most practical situations. Okay, I won't go through this example, but I'll now talk about strength. Um, we did a whole lot of triaxles. Um, these are closed system tests on unsaturated samples that were very loose. Uh, void ratios around the 0.9 mark. Degrees of saturation around the 0.6 to 0.8 mark. Uh, we, we did the test by closing the valves on the sample. So we stopped water and air being able to exit or enter a sample. So we have a closed system or a constant mass condition. And you see that you get sort of a response that's typical of a loose material, but we also get some void ratio reduction because we have enough air in the pore space, which is compressible, that it um, reduces in volume. So we can start to pick off things like you know, peaks in our stress responses, which might represent an instability line and things like that. And, and, and now try and relate that to things we traditionally uh, do in our stability assessments. It so happens that the instability line depends on the degree of saturation and, and, and becomes steeper as our degree of saturation reduces. That's what the numbers are in the parentheses here is our degrees of saturation. But so yeah, still very well-defined instability lines, but obviously depending on the degree of saturation now. But there's another interesting fact here, and that is that there's a load path dependence to our instability line, which doesn't exist for a saturated state. These, these instability lines are 
just simply taken to be the peak of a low path in our PQ plane. But if we then do a different load path where we have initial state here and then keep Q constant as we increase the water pressures or reduce suction, we get a very different point of instability. And that is shown by this inset. Those dots are points where we adopted a slightly different load path to cause instability. And you can see that they're not locating on the same instability lines. This is only true for unsaturated states. The load path is not really important for saturated state. The same instability line applies whatever the load path. But for unsaturated, there is a real load path dependence that we haven't fully understood and it's something we, we're working on now. But eventually we hope to get its instability lines and knowledge around them into a state that we can use in practice and, and uh, do all the usual things. We can plot things like um, critical strength ratios at you know, post liquefaction or <clears throat> you know, phase transformation points and so on against initial mean effective stresses against state parameters. The data becomes all a bit clumped and, and, and difficult to interpret. So I, I find it a bit easier and more practically useful to use a modified state parameter in the presentation. Here, it's been defined with reference to the saturated critical state line. And the strengths as well have been non-dimensionalized using a total stress rather than an effective stress. And you can see that for a degree of saturation 0 0.65, <clears throat> these are our post liquefaction strengths against that state parameter. This is lab data with degree of saturation next to it. Here's degree of saturation 0 0.85, degree of saturation of uh, one in here. So you can see now that, you know, depending on your state parameter, you go up and now you can read across and get that post liquefaction strength ratio for a given degree of saturation. So again, this data is unpublished. We're still putting it together, trying to clarify it and, and really tidy it up and present it in a way that suits practice, but this is where we're heading as well. Look, this is just a, a summary of, where, of what we know so far. Phreatic surface and below, we use saturated soil mechanics. We have a hydrostatic water table that extends above the phreatic into a capillary rise section where we have a negative water pressure. And it's only above that do we have this deviation from the hydrostatic. And this is where we use unsaturated soil mechanics. If the volume of air is very large compared to the overall volume, we can, we can use this equivalent method and determine you know, things like normalized current resistances and apply all the usual relationships. And uh, to because uh, we have this pseudo-drained condition all the time, the chi S part is always constant. It also means we can use these equivalent unit you know, weights and cohesions in our strength and stability assessments. But this is where we, we're still a bit stuck and don't know what to do. Um, the, uh, when the volume of air is very small compared to the overall volume, um, you know, we have this complicated mixture of partial saturation, partial drainage, chi -S is no longer constant. And we don't really yet know how to deal with that in practice. The, the, probably the best advice I can give at this stage is just to do a total stress analysis using a cohesion total, a phi total, but make sure that the load path you use to determine those properties are represented in the load path that you expect in the field because those total stress strength parameters depend very much on the load path. Look, um, This is the, the sort of the conclusion slide, but it's basically what I just said. Equivalent unit weight and cohesion when we have 
pseudo drained conditions work really well. You don't need to resort to the inbuilt features of an unsaturated soil software. Um, in the capillary rise region, we can use saturated soil mechanics. We need to correctly put the negative water pressures into our effective stresses when we interpret our CPT data to determine states and so on. And, uh, but when we have very small volumes of air, we've still got a lot of uncertainties and we're working on that now. Look, um, I'll, I'll stop there, uh, Philippe. Um, so, I'll, I'll happily take some questions. Adrian, uh, hmm. thank you very, very much for the for the presentation. It's uh, I think it's it was a fascinating, very interesting lecture. Um, Unsaturated soil mechanics is so has so many features that set them apart from classical soil mechanics. Somehow, um, I I would like to I I have a lot of questions, uh, but maybe I can do them later or once we we are finished. Uh, so I would like uh, to ask uh, the public to to make some questions to 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 talk with professor russell is are there any questions with about what professor russell presented here i think it's very very clear it was a very very clear presentation adrian any question is a good question Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Any question is a good question. Uh, are there any questions from, from the colleagues here in the chat? Okay, Jorge, do you want to do you want to talk or would you prefer by chat? By chat, okay. Uh, okay, I, I can see. Or, or raise question. your hands because there is one question. Yes, I I, I can read it for you. Um, thank you for the presentation. The question is from Jorge Yanes, a Chilean engineer. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if Jorge is either in England or or here, but uh, uh, he has two questions. Which method in C two testing lab instrumentation, would you recommend to determine the suction distribution in tailings? Uh, and the second question is, would you recommend the Barcelona basic model to analyze the mechanical behavior or of unsaturated tailings? Yeah, so no, good question. So <clears throat> measuring suction is possible using vibrating wire piezometers, as long as it's less than 100 kilopascals. <clears throat> now, we, we do this in our laboratory. These are just commercial vibrating wire piezometers, exactly like industry use. And we can measure suctions as large as 100 kilopascals. And the, the piezometers usually come with a special ceramic, tip is like a high air entry ceramic. That means that if you saturate them properly, um, they can measure negative water pressures up to 100 kilopascals. Uh, 100 kilopascals is the limit because you then get cavitation and desaturation and they become unreliable. Um, now, you need to be really careful to saturate them properly. This is using a system that's a little bit more complicated than normal, but you have to put them in a special device and you, you elevate the pressure to plus 500 kilopascals and you reduce it to minus 100 or a vacuum. 
and you cycle up and down between those limits by three or four times. And then it becomes fully saturated. Uh, and if you don't do that, they, you don't measure those negative water pressures reliably. So that, that's just something to be aware of. Um, the procedure to saturate them is well documented in the literature. Um, and uh, but I can send you more information if you want to learn it. Now, the, the, the thing is, when you put these piezometers inside your tailings, if you bury them in an unsaturated region to begin with, if the suction is larger than 100, the suction will pull the water out of the piezometer tip and they become unreliable. So you need to either bury them in a saturated region to begin with and where you think it might become unsaturated later, or pick a region where the, the suction is already less than 100 when you put them in. But otherwise they'll desaturate and become unreliable. Okay. Uh, now, would I use a Barcelona basic model? Look, I mean, it's got some problems which are well documented. Um, I, I think this equivalent method is better. If, if you know your um, degree of saturation is, is less than 0 0.5 or 0 0.7, you've got enough air in the pore space, so you've got a drainage bay in there. You can just use these equivalent cohesions and unit weights. It's only when you have much higher degrees of saturation and you get this complicated suction behavior change. Look, the Barcelona basic model has got some problems, but it, so does every other model that's advocated in these softwares. So, you know, maybe be really careful if you use it. Advice. Which model do you use particularly when when it comes to 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 apply this into into soil models? We use one that we built ourselves, and it's called the UNSW bounding surface model, and it's been coded into one of the softwares. Um, I can't remember which one. It's not. It's not FLAC, it's... Um, Maybe Plaxis? It might be Plaxis, yeah. But I, I don't know how practitioners can access that yet. Um, but if, if someone wants to learn more, they can just email me and I'll put them in touch with the, the right people. Yeah. I see, I see. Jorge, do you have more questions? Now the mic is uh, it's open. It's open for... It's... Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's uh, it can be used by anyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. Uh, I, I don't have any more questions. Thank you for the answers. All right. It's Good all clear. Uh, maybe Tomas and uh, Tomas, you had, you had some questions? Yes. Yes, professor. Um, Professor Russell, thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Um, you, you said that um, the, the effect of unsaturated condition um, are more important at low stress levels. Um, so uh, can we think in a total stress level above um, 300 kilopascal, for example, or more, in which unsaturated effects could become less in, less important in, in CPT interpretation? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So <clears throat> look, the suction won't add a lot to the effective stress when you're at 300 kilopascals, but, but if it's unsaturated and you've got air in the pore space, then the tailings behavior becomes drained. It, look, it looks drained. So the, the partial saturation influence is mostly on the, the controlling the behavior of the material rather than strength. So it's not 
So when you push a cone, you can't assume it's an undrained scenario, right? You have to assume it's a, a drained one. So in, in that example, even though the stress is very large and suction's not adding a lot to the affected stress, it, it controls the way the tailings behaves around the cone. Okay, thanks. Does that make um, sense? Okay, thanks. And so, um, for example, an interpretation with the cavity expansion in a dry nut mode could be a good chance to, to have a better uh, CPT inter interpretation in that case of high is, is stress levels? Yeah, so, no, so w w when the stresses are high, even if suction is small, like I said, it, it, it means that the, the tailings behavior, you know, the tailings skeleton can change in volume as you push a cone because the air is compressible. So it looks as though it's drained and, and that's the most important influence of the partial saturation. Okay, thank you. Um, Marcelo. I, Felipe, I, I don't know if, he, can you hear me? What? Yeah, all good. Okay. Yeah, I, I have uh, two questions, but related between each other. Um, the first one, uh, we have uh, in conventional uh, copper tailings, um, multi-layer systems, no? Uh, you have layers uh, with coarse and fine sand uh, deposit in, in these uh, copper tailings. And my question is, um, have you noted uh, what is the influence in the behavior of the cone, the CPT cone, when you have this stratified deposit? And also, this is the first question. And the second question is, uh, how you characterize this deposit, multi-layer deposit, with a state parameter, uh, with a, a unified state parameter? This is my second question. But this is... This is a good question. Um, look, uh, my experience with cone testing in a, in a laboratory is where we where we try and make a sample that is perfectly homogeneous. Um, we still see a cone resistance that zigzags. You know, we get some variability by plus or minus forty percent. Right. And uh, you know, small differences in stiffness and void ratio you know, still cause a big QC variation. So I guess in a, in a real tailings where you've got layering and as well as variabilities inside each layer, you know, scatter in your QC measurement is unavoidable. But but. I'm also not worried about that. If you kind of take an average QC or a lower bounds QC through your data and, and, and use that in your interpretations and assume the tailings is, is homogenous, I think that is good enough. And, you, you know, you that calculate a state parameter or a void ratio. Or, but again, you're using a lower bounds number usually and, and and I think there's enough conservatism built into that that um, we don't need to worry too much about layering that that's my view um, I know people who think layering is a big deal um, but but it's unavoidable and and I, I'm not too worried about it, to be honest as long as you use lower bounds um, estimations of QC and state parameter, I think you're okay. Um, what was the other question? There was... Uh, Marcelo, there was another... Marcelo, había otra pregunta? No, no I, uh, actually, uh, the variability of, of the 
of the state parameter in this deposit of trailing deposit yeah. using the the lower band uh, uh, we usually do uh, in our practice, you know. Yeah. And um, but uh, still, when you have this correlation, that is, is the state parameter with the, some strain uh, parameters. Uh, you are using a, a, a uniform state parameter, <laughs> and uh, That's right. but when you are, you have the reality. Is not a uniform. Is this layering? So you have yeah. like I, I don't know if the this correlation are uh, precisely in this way. You know. I mean, look, yeah, it, 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 it won't be precise, but like I said, I think as long as you take the lower bound, I think that's reasonable. You know, because <clears throat> there would be regions where, where it is stronger that you are ignoring. So if you, if you just take the lower bounds, I think there's a lot of conservatism in that and, and that's probably the best way to go. Um, Sorry, uh, and this layering, uh, have you observed some uh, um, uh, consequence in the in the drain and drain behavior of the tailings? Or, or yeah, that, that's something that that's something we haven't looked at yet. Um, so whether layering changes your response to be undrained to, to drained or partially drained. If the difference is big, um, yeah, that, that could be more of a concern than the, the variability in density. And, um, you know, a drain's penetration generally has a QC that is three times larger than an undrained one. So that can, uh, but, but you need a very different <clears throat> tailings to shift from drained to undrained. It needs to, you know, have a big change in the particle size distribution. And I'm not sure if that, Variability, how often that will occur inside of real tailings. I, I um, you know, if you're getting like really clay layers and really sand layers that are only 50 millimeters deep, then you've got a really complicated problem where you're, mm. you're pushing through undrained and then drained and then undrained and drained, and, and your cone doesn't have time to adjust properly from one to the next. Mm. But if, you, if you're in a silty mixture that is always partially drained, shifting a little bit more to undrained and a little bit more to fully drained, maybe it doesn't matter so much. I, yeah. I guess if you have sand and clay layers, then if they're only 50 millimeters deep, you, you can't do anything reliably. It's, you have to need, you need at least sort of half a meter of one type to, to, to sort of separate out the data and analyze it independently. Okay, okay, thank you very much for your answers. Huh? Thank you. Gracias, Marcelo. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, Professor Bart, you, you have a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, good night, Professor Russell. Thank you for your clarifying presentation. It's very useful. Uh, we have the chance to perform a, a lot of CPTU in uh, thick tailings. So we have not the problem of layering tailings, but uh, what uh, uh, the problem that we have is to determine uh, is that uh, they are silty tailings. They have a, they have a, a content of, of salt, and uh, we don't we don't um, can reproduce the suction in the laboratory because uh, in the laboratory they, they, they don't use silty water. So do you think that uh, there is an important uh, influence of the silty solution in the behavior of the tailings? Mm. Talk about salt. <clears throat> Excuse me? Sorry, I, do you mean salt or silt? No, salt. 
salt, okay. Yeah. Dilute and salt. Yes. <clears throat> so salt um, affects a tailings behavior if, if there is clay minerals. So um, the salt changes the, the, the clay mineralogy, the diffuse double layer, and um, it, it changes things like the, the particle contact stiffnesses and the mechanical behavior. So if you've got clay minerals plus salts inside a tailings dam, then you need to have that same salt inside your laboratory samples as well to get an accurate, um, you know. Uh, and that, that is very difficult to, to try. It's very difficult, absolutely. Yes. yes. But it's only when you've got clay. So you need at least 10% mm. uh, clay. Mm. If, if it's just sand and silt, like, like uh, it's not such a problem. Okay. Okay, the salt doesn't do much to the mechanical behavior. Thank you. And I wonder if there are more questions for Professor Russell. I, uh, if there are no more questions, I will do one. <laughs> uh, There is one thing that that called my attention is uh, that is regarding how to. Or maybe maybe Tomas did a similar questions if if I understood uh, properly. Uh, but is there any? For instance, if you have a, if you are doing a CPT, and you mm -hmm. see that the response of the water pressure goes to the opposite side, right? To the left, let's say to the left, just thinking very, very simple. You could either interpret that as either a, a very dense layer of soil having negative pore pressures, or you could have it, uh, or you could have a an unsaturated section. So yeah. having, having those alternatives uh, uh, to, to explain the observation, is there any difference maybe in the response of how the water increases? Let's say in the, in the shape of the curve, the velocity of the, of the response or something like that, that allow us to uh, discriminate if we are facing uh, an unsaturated part of the soil or uh, a very dense soil? That's a really good question. And <clears throat> so you're right, you could have negative water pressures because it's very, very, very dense or mm -hmm. because you're in capillary rise section. Exactly. And you need to know, you need to know which one. And um, I think uh, you would have to do a dissipation test to be sure. And, the and, dissipation and that, test. Yeah, because the, the pore pressures would then come down to some, some stable value after the test, which could be negative if you have capillary rise, or they'll be positive if you have a dense material. So... Yeah, no, it's very important because when you plot, when you interpret the data, you need the initial mean effective stress inside this normalized cone resistance. And so you, to compute that properly, you need to know whether your water pressure is initially negative or positive or, or whatever. And so, but yeah, you need to, you know, just, I mean, dissipation tests are routine. You do them every two meters or five meters anyway. So you would do one in that region just to explore that issue. I see, I see. Thank you. Um, I think uh, just, uh, just out, out of curiosity and, and understanding that the equipment to, to perform research on unsaturated tests are very, very specific. Uh, 
in your university, I, I don't recall it well, but you work with equipment that you have created and also equipment that you have bought or, or only equipment developed by on your own? Um, <clears throat> no, we, we, we use commercial triaxial systems. Um, that, so we buy those which test unsaturated cement. It's the big machines like the calibration chamber and the earthquake shaking table that we build ourselves. Yeah. I see. So, um, but the small stuff like uh, the routine salt testing, we just buy that. Yeah. Yeah, because, because if you, let, let's say in the case that Professor Bart was suggesting with, with salt, in that case, you would need a, uh, equipment to, to sacrifice somehow. Uh, yeah, okay, for salts, <clears throat> yeah, you can't buy that. <laughs> so, exactly. so if it's really specialist testing like salts or elevated temperature, or, yeah, you, you often mm. need to make that yourself, yeah. So with our salts work, we've modified a, a commercial trioxal machine to um, inject salt pore fluid. So you need um, stainless steel, you know, so you don't get corrosion and things like this. Yeah. Be because the presence of salts would induce a change in the viscosity of the fluid, or yeah. would that influence yeah. the, the response of the pore Not pressure? Not so much. Okay. No, no, the, it just changes the, um, like I said, the mechanical stiffness of the soil, okay. the tailings. Okay, okay. And um, the, the particle the particle contact forces, so it affects your friction angles and things like that too. But, um, okay. but okay. yeah, we, we have to inject salt. <clears throat> or, you, or you can just add salt to the, to the, the, the soil or the tailings to begin with and then add water. But, but you want to mimic whatever it is you've got um, in the tailings. And, uh, but there are many instruments that measure water pressures and, and then they obviously become exposed to the salt. So they then uh, uh, corrode and you need to obviously lots mm -hmm. of maintenance and replacements to, to, uh, to do the testing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um... I, I, I think no nobody has more questions. Uh, if there are if there are any more questions, this is the last time to to ask <laughs> the last opportunity to ask something to Professor Russell before we say bye. It seems that it's it it they are all they are all good with the with the with the presentation it it was a really really nice presentation to see uh i mean unsaturated soil mechanics is a an absolutely people some some might think that the differences are not that much but they are really really nice i mean really really big not nice big yeah, yeah. so uh, definitely a topic to to get involved especially for, for the new generations, right? The mm. new generations. Uh, so far, classical soil mechanics has, has ruled somehow. And, uh, and definitely there is a need to understand the soil in, in, deeper, in a deeper way, mm. in a deeper way. Mm. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Russell. I really appreciate the time you took to, to share with us your, your knowledge. Thank you very, very much. Um, it was a pleasure and thank you for the opportunity. It, it's been very nice. So thank you very much. Uh, we will upload this presentation for, for the public in, in our YouTube channel. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Uh, I, I, I will stay here with uh, Professor Russell for a, for a bit. Talking a, little, uh, talking a little bit more. Uh, and uh, thank okay. you everyone again.
and we'll see you in the next seminar in, in August uh, when we start a new semester. So thank you, Professor Russell. Uh, muchas gracias a todos. Y nos vemos prontamente. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Muchas gracias. Gracias, profesor. Gracias, profesor. Gracias, profesor. Gracias, profesor. Gracias, chao, chao. Gracias. Que esté muy bien. Muchas gracias. Thank you.